Hello. So today I want to tell you about a new way uh, of thinking about the origin of life problem that has implications for astrobiology and the search for life in the universe. But also, as I think you'll see, says something interesting about the nature of evolution and how it relates to as a kind of biological change, such as uh, succession. Uh, and I want to acknowledge this is a, a, a collaboration um, with an interdisciplinary team, including uh, Jen Peng, Emily Dolson, Eric Smith, Prafal Gagrani, and Alex Plum. So the, um, the problem we're trying to understand is how complex life could originate, given that we, while we understand that conventional Darwinian evolution has ways to accumulate complexity, the machinery needed for Darwinian evolution, namely some kind of individuated cell or organism and a genetic machinery to encode information, is too complicated to arise spontaneously. And so the approach that we're taking is to try and um, imagine that when life originated, there was some simpler mode of change, which uh, we consider to be more like ecological succession, that gradually morphed over time to give rise to the features uh, with the result in the efficient kind of adaptive evolution we see today, Darwinian evolution. Now, in order to make this understand and analyze this transition, we need a way to uh, to describe both succession and Darwinian evolution in the same conceptual framework with formal map on, mapping of equivalences. And the way we do that is by defining something called an autocatalytic chemical ecosystem. So these autocatalytic chemical ecosystems um, are either bounded or unbounded. An example of a bounded ecosystem would be a cell or an organism. The example of an unbounded uh, ecosystem would be a, a patch in a continuous, uh, in a landscape. Uh, and within these ecosystems, um, there, there, have, there, there are autocatalytic cycles represented here by little Pac-Man that can interact with one another ecologically and can exchange resources represented by these dots. Um, now, these ecosystems are then connected or potentially connected to as to one another in a larger meta-ecosystem. So... Uh, why is this so important? Well, the core, why is the autocatalytic unit of this so important? The reason it's so important is the autocatalytic units are what allow ecosystems in general to uh, sort of change intrinsically. Um, and so if you imagine an empty ecosystem and you introduce an adult or an egg of, uh, of, uh, of, a, of some species, that can now undergo an autocatalytic self-amplification. So the adult can give rise to a branching reaction to multiple eggs that can each give rise to adults, um, or one adult can give rise to one egg, but then persist to be able to give rise to additional eggs. And as a result of this, uh, if there's enough food in the environment, the count of, um, of this species can increase to a carrying capacity based on the rate of food flux and can re then remain stable in the environment, even if the environment changes within bounds. So it's a so the, the the environment is sort of changed permanently by the seeding event of one of these uh, of the members of an autocatalytic cycle. It's also worth remembering that there are higher level autocatalytic cycles um, resulting from ecological interactions among individual species. So, for example, these uh, if you're two pairwise obligate mutualists, they form another higher level autocatalytic cycle. It turns out the same kind of things are happening within cells. There are autocatalytic cycles, both named ones, such as the reductive citric acid cycle, which whose members can increase in count, um, provided there's sufficient flux of food, carbon dioxide, and reducing power. Um, and um, but that's not it, because we've developed a, an interest of integer programming approach to search in chemical reaction networks of metabolisms. And you can find uncountably many autocatalytic cycles that can uh, utilize food represented with the blue colors here to, to amplify the members of the cycle. Uh, and many of these are also seed dependent. They will not be initiated until you introduce one member um, and then once that's introduced, the cycle can then persist uh, indefinitely in principle with a sufficient food flux. Um, there are also, uh, yeah, so um, that's not the only cycles in cells. There are also life, uh, uh, autocatalytic cycles arising because of catalysis. So an enzyme that catalyzes an upstream step that ultimately promotes the production of the catalyst also generates autocatalytic cycles that can be redrawn in that format by defining a substrate 
enzyme complex that can separate in a branching reaction. And genes themselves form basically life cycles, autocatalytic cycles, where, uh, where strand separation is a branching reaction. Um, and that can, allows indirectly, in one case, to generate more members of this autocatalytic cycle over time. So what we see is that basically subcellular ecosystems, metabolisms are equivalent in some broad sense to conventional biological ecosystems. There are many autocatalytic cycles at many hierarchical levels that interact with one another in diverse ways. And those cycles form a sort of a unit of memory because once they spin up, they tend to persist. And they're the basis of heritability and, uh, pers and pers stability of ecosystems. So that's what happens in a single ecosystem. In order to really think about change, we have to look at a meta-ecosystem. So if we look at a meta-ecosystem of cells or a population, then uh, the frequency of autocatalytic cycles can change over time. So if we focus just on these autocatalytic cycles, the blue one and the red one, these maybe gene cycles, uh, over time, the frequency can change, the red one can increase. And these changes can either be because of chance, difference uh, over time, um, or they could be because the autocatalytic cycle has an effect on the capacity of the ecosystem they're in to persist and, and maybe in this case divide. So, um, so both selection and drift affect the, um, the change, can affect the change in the frequency of autocatalytic cycles in a meta ecosystem. Something similar can happen in succession. So if we first of all, if we think about a meta ecosystem, each of those local ecosystems is uh, undergoes occasional seeding events that trigger a new species life cycle. Um, and over time in that meta ecosystem, the frequencies of different species or ecosystem uh, cycles can change. Now, this change could be um, in the meta ecosystem could be shaped largely by chance. But it can be the case that certain uh, or certain species or certain combinations of species can make the ecosystem resistant to disturbance. And as a result, there's something analogous to selection happening at this level too. So there are, there's a way to map these two processes on quite well, but there are obviously differences. And those differences, oh, uh, I'll come back to in a second. But first, I wanted to point out that this helps us with the original life problem for the simple reason that even before there were cells or metabolisms, there would have been autocatalytic cycles on the planet that could feed on the kinds of foods that would be generated by spontaneous chemistry in the environment. So there are some well-known ones uh, like the Formos reaction that feeds on formaldehyde uh, and once seeded uh, uh, by an aldehyde can generate this cycle. Um, and can generate lots of sugars, it turns out, by some other, um, by a bigger cycle. Um, so we've we've run our algorithm on abiotic cycles, and we find, again, a, uncountably many autocatalytic cycles sitting in abiological reaction networks. These Some of these are seedable. And uh, moreover, we often, we've even found trophic levels. So there could be certain autocatalytic cycles that can be seeded, but only if another one has been seeded first, um, because they depend upon some waste product of an earlier seeded autocatalytic cycle. So before there was life, there was chemical succession happening in the environment, uh, in which we could imagine little patches over time, rare reactions generate seed molecules uh, or molecules coming in an asteroids trigger these autocatalytic cycles. They can establish and maintain themselves. And over time, the frequency of autocatalytic cycles in a meta ecosystem can change. So these are similarities, but there are differences. And I think that there are two big ones. The first one is uh, yeah, biological ecosystems are self-bound, um, meaning that they, um, they, they, uh, they create their own boundaries. And this enforces co-dispersal dynamics, which means that the autocatalytic cycles tend to move together, which results in them cooperating. Um, reduce suppresses cheetahs and amplifies the uh, the cell unit or the organism unit as a target of selection. In a uh, in a landscape, the, eco the ecosystems are not bounded in the same way, which means that the individual autocatalytic cycles can move in rather independently. Which even when there is selection for ecosystem fitness, in the sense of uh, or e certain autocatalytic cycles being able to resist extinction, there's going to be more of a problem with cheetahs. 
Um, um, and then, but um, the other big difference is the nature of seeding. Seeding in modern cells is primarily by mu uh, a, a, a mutation, which is a rare reaction that generates a new autocatalytic cycle. But that autocatalytic cycle uh, has a, uh, members are similar, very similar to one that was there before because they are a modification of it. As a result, there's a relatively high probability of that cycle being viable. Um, and that allows for efficient hill walking during evolution. Uh, in contrast, in uh, in ecosystems, the, um, the most familiar kind of seeding event would be a dispersal event from the outside. Um, and those will be independent of what was already there, which means that there's less a priori probability that it will be able to enhance, um, you know, that it will be viable and be able to enhance ecosystem fitness. It's worth remembering, though, that in an abiotic sense, um, these um, th th there would be rare reactions that would happen locally, um, and those rare reactions would also be similar to mutations, potentially. So anyway, how do these two things accumulate over time? Well, as long as you have selection at the ecosystem level, um, whereby certain combinations of autocatalytic cycles can affect the stability of, um, of, eco uh, of those ecosystems, then you could then autocatalytic cycles that can co-disperse themselves with these beneficial um, uh, autocatalytic cycles will be favored. And so we would expect to see the evolution of co-dispersal mechanisms. These co-dispersal mechanisms could even involve the formation of chemicals that form some kind of vesicle and grab the members of other autocatalytic cycles to then float around and find another ecosystem patch to colonize. Those propagules would be then could be seen as the precursors of cells. So individuation, autopoiesis could be the product of adaptive ecosystem evolution. The same is true for the genetic systems. Genetic systems can arise uh, if there are template mediating, uh, if there are polymers that have a tendency to be template replicating, uh, and those uh, are able to have catalytic functions that enhance ecosystem function. If they do that, for example, catalyzing food fixation, then they benefit themselves and they benefit um, the whole ecosystem. Um, and um, and if there's ecosystem level selection, they can be they can increase in frequency. Um, interestingly, once you have those catalysts that provide those ecosystem level services, additional catalysts that I that could be favored for that promote that indirectly. For example, by promoting polymerization or ensuring that polymerization is um, is uh, more uh, more faithful. Uh, as a result, genetic systems can bootstrap themselves into existence. So given all this, uh, we see that uh, it's possible that there was a gradual transition from succession-like change to Darwinian change by the acquisition of both uh, um, autopoiesis, co-dispersal, and genetic systems. And this suggests that life might be more predictable. Uh, the origin of life might be more e predictable and maybe easier than we, than we usually think, uh, which can guide astrobiological research and also laboratory research, such as we're doing in my lab, well, we're trying to look for sort of a, a, a prebiotic chemical uh, dynamics to see if we see evidence of these, e these ecological and evolution-like dynamics. So with that, I want to thank my, uh, my collaborators um, and uh, uh, um, co-authors and my funding agent, my funder. Um, and uh, I just leave you with some references and say thank you for your attention.